something there. Who's our team keeper? Still more energy to do mood for preparation, so we are going to end the session at 4.30. Um, and we're going to have the majority of the time for Q&A. So if you have any Q&A, we're going to end even earlier. So um, we are going to uh, report quickly on the breakout sessions so that you can get a general flavor for the sessions you were not able to attend. Um, and so we're going to speak very briefly and then we'll move right into the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to start and try to stick to a very strict timetable. Um, and I was in the, the session with Virginia and uh, Rosemary Case on political participation, looking at political rights. Rosemary and I were focusing in particular on um, legal aspects um, in implementing the right to political participation for persons with disabilities and focusing uh, in particular on election access within this broader context of democracy and governance and democracy promotion, um, which is certainly an area that's um, where there's some funding um, in, by United States donors, by the UN, by, uh, and by some of the other uh, bilateral and multilateral donors. So kind of looking at this particular area of election access where DPOs have done incredibly interesting work um, and increasingly, we're seeing very successful legal challenges to restrictions and limitations on voting rights, on political participation for persons with disabilities, everywhere from Japan to the United States um, to uh, across Europe. Um, some really interesting things are being done because no country in the world effectively implements the right to political participation for persons with disabilities, and most countries um, specifically discriminate on, on the basis of disability with respect to some element or aspect of voting, particularly restricting voting rights for persons under guardianship or persons um, of quote-unquote unsound mind. Um, so it's a, it's a very rich area of disability rights advocacy, and CRPD has become a great tool for that. One legal highlight is a case that came out before the CRPD was adopted, and that was with the, uh, for the African Commission, Burrett versus Moore. Really interesting case. It's actually a right to health case in many respects. But the commission in that case said that the removal of voting rights for persons who were in a psychiatric hospital in the Gambia, that, that was impermissible and a violation of the African Charter. So it was a health rights case, but they actually seized upon um, some other rights violations, including political rights violations. So really interesting and rich area. I'm now handing it over to Virginia to talk mm -hmm. more about this area. Thank you, Janet. Um, so I've got three minutes to quickly give you a little bit of a taste of some of the country-specific examples that we talked about of both barriers and some good practice examples. Uh, we started off the conversation by talking about the electoral cycle, which is three different phases around the election process. So the elections are more than just election day. It has the pre-election phase where you work on voter registration and making sure that the voters list is correct, preparation for the actual election. Then the electoral period, which is the cycle on election day, and that's the actual implementation of policies and procedures like um, preferential um, queue jumping, for example, or training poll workers so that they know how to administer to the vote to people with disabilities. And then we talked about the post-electoral phase, which is the time after elections, when you have an opportunity to be involved in lessons learned and, sh and sharing your experiences with the election management body, election law reform. And all of these different phases kind of, as you can imagine, bleed into a, a broader process that's always ongoing. And so we talked about a couple specific examples, um, one being voter registration as a really important area for DPOs to focus on. Um, and that's because many people with disabilities, children when they're born with a disability, are not given the, the proper documentation in order to register to vote. Then they turn of age and they can't vote. They don't have the paperwork that they need. And so this is a, a good aspect um, to focus on in the pre-electoral phase. And some good examples that we talked about there um, were in Nepal, for example, where information on how to register to vote was produced in Braille for the very first time um, in 2012 for elections there. We also then talked about voter education and how important it is for voter education to be conducted in accessible formats. And we discussed some challenges, for example, in the Dominican Republic, the election management body there has a TV station 
where they actually show for a whole month in advance of the elections shows about how to vote, where you go to vote, information about the different candidates and their platforms. And we were able to convince them, along with our DPO partners, to make uh, to include sign language capture a sign language um, box on this video on this TV station. And then we learned there's only two sign language interpreters that are qualified in the entire country. And so, you know, even when we have some progress on convincing government to be accessible and inclusive, you then sometimes encounter other challenges. Uh, we talked about examples of ways that you can ensure that voter education is inclusive that don't cost any additional money. So for example, in Armenia, including images of people with disabilities in a poster in the voter education materials doesn't cost any additional money, but it shows people with disabilities as equal citizens and out voting and having equal rights on election day. Um, we talked a little bit about election observation. Um, many election observer groups don't include questions related to disability access on their checklists. So they're the ones that are determining and writing these you know, authoritative reports on our elections inclusive and free and fair, and they're leaving out 15%, at least in most cases, of that country's population in that reporting. And so the need to do a lot of advocacy with election observer groups in order to adjust their questions, but also to encourage them to recruit people with disabilities as observers. Um, and a really good example of that recently is just in Kosovo last year, where people with disabilities were trained as long-term and short-term observers, and actually went to campaign events, to rallies in advance, and made sure that the candidates were conducting their events in an inclusive way, and also addressing issues that were important to the disability community there. And then lastly, we talked a little bit about the need for implementation and enforcement. So many states do actually have good laws. As Janet mentioned, most actually have severe issues related to intellectual and psychosocial disability in terms of unsound mind and other clauses being in the law. But in terms of physical access, many states have okay laws on the books, but they're not implemented and they're not enforced. Um, and so I showed an example of a polling station in Pennsylvania in the US where that photo was actually taken by a US lawyer who works for the federal government. And his whole job is to go out on election day and monitor compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act to make sure that local precincts are, are making their polling stations accessible. And so in this instance, the federal law will actually, the federal government will actually sue local governments for not being compliant. And so that's a really unique aspect in terms of ensuring that what is written down on paper is actually implemented. <coughs> and so I've just got my, my time is out. So <laughs> pass it down the line here. <laughs> well done. Well done. Okay. Um, okay, so in our breakout session, we were looking at um, Article 19 in practice, so Article 19 and Article 32, and what that looks like in practice. So we used, looked through the concluding observations of the CRPD committee to identify <coughs> some of the issues that the committee has repeatedly highlighted to the different countries that have come before it on Article 19. And so what I'd like to do is to quickly say what some of the issues were and to quickly say then what some of our proposals were and then highlight some remaining challenges that we left open as questions. Um, so on the issue of deinstitutionalization, for example, one of the key issues, of course, was the continuing use of funds to, um, of development funds to build more institutions. And we also saw how in the context of developing countries, there's a link between Article 24 and Article 12 in which because of continuing segregated education for children with disabilities, children with disabilities in developing countries do experience institutionalization in that regard. And one of our proposals then was that DPOs should use shadow reporting um, to the CRPD committee to highlight this link between Article 24 and Article 19 in the context of developing countries especially. But the continuing challenge there is the um, cross-life course discussion that is not yet taking place. In many places, the discussion between children, um, rights organizations, older people's organizations, and DPOs on this issue of institutionalization hasn't taken root yet. The other issue we talked about was isolation within the community. Um, and the problem is, of course, in places where institutions do not proliferate, um, people with disabilities often experience 
isolation, um, are concealed, are locked up, are not part of the community even if they are physically located within the community. And some of the proposals that we had on this were um, sharing the need for research and sort of sharing good practice models in, in countries that are implementing innovative ways of, 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 of including people, even people with high support needs. So that, that's one of the, the, the proposals that we had. And in terms of the, con, of the continuing challenges then, was sort of, um, so community-based rehabilitation is one of the ways in which countries are attempting to do this, but community-based rehabilitation tends to focus on health and not so much inclusion within the community. So this then has, has remain, remains an issue and how do we address community-based rehabilitation in order to make sure it's really used to enable people with disabilities to participate. Um, yeah, so I think at, at this point, I'd also highlight one more thing that I think was useful. Um, just basically on the issue, of, on the question of choice and control, which is key to Article 19 of the CRPD, um, I think it came out very clearly that often we use the excuse of resources to say, oh, we don't have enough funds to do this Article 19 thing. But actually a lot of things don't cost that much money, a lot of things that have to do with inclusion are not actually expensive things so it's just thinking creatively and being willing to do it okay so um, i'm going to give a report back on the session on gender equality and disability inclusive development uh, so this session uh, was uh, presented by myself and dr mary Kiyoku, who unfortunately could not be here today and she, she began her side of the presentation by really laying out the policy issues as well as the normative and legal side of things. And one of the first things she pointed out was the issue of invisibility of women and girls with disabilities in international and domestic policies. So those policies that deal with women have often left women with disabilities out and those policies that deal with disability have often forgotten women. So there's this invisibility aspect that is, that is uh, dominant. She also went on to um, sort of identify specific key areas in which women and girls with disabilities were not included. And these include education, employment, health, family, motherhood, and legal capacities. And she also uh, attributed these low levels of, of participation to things like societal prejudices, things like physical inaccessibility of uh, health facilities, for example, or even schools, and also a lack of awareness and sensitivity to the needs of women and girls with disabilities. She pointed out that there have been, prior to the CRPD, instruments which did recognize uh, women with disabilities, such as the uh, the World Program of Action Concerning Disabled Persons and the United Nations Standard Rules on Equalization of Opportunities for Persons with Disabilities, as well as CEDO, these did recognize, but not to the extent that the CRPD has done. So the CRPD has taken a, comp a much more comprehensive approach to the issue of discrimination faced by women and girls with disabilities in the sense that the CRPD in its Article 6 recognizes that women face um, multiple discrimination, discrimination on, the multi on multiple levels, first just as women and secondly as, as disabilities. So those two are aspects of their identity interact to form like a unique uh, uh, um, experience of discrimination for women with disabilities. Um, my side of the presentation uh, focused more on the issue of violence against women and girls with disabilities. So I uh, went on to discuss uh, the, the, the prevalence of violence against women with disabilities. Statistics say that they're uh, twice as likely to experience violence uh, as opposed to uh, women with non-disabled, uh, no, women with no disabilities, I beg your pardon. And they also face uh, violence, different forms of violence, in, in multiple settings, such as in the home, in the community, in the workplace, at schools, in institutional settings, on the transnational level uh, where we're dealing with cases of uh, natural disasters and, and, and um, war situations. 
and several we identified several factors which um, can which were attributed to the prevalence of, um, of violence against women with women and girls with disabilities, and these include things like living in close settings, power inequalities between the victim and the perpetrator, social stereotypes, and laws that apply for uh, that allow the deprivation of legal capacity for women with disabilities. So just to conclude. This was a session where we really just tried to come up with um, solutions for, for women with disabilities, how they can be included. And we did that in a group <laughs> session, which I'm afraid I don't have time to give you a rundown of that. So, but thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Questions, comments? Um, good afternoon. I think all the speakers, at least I had the benefit of, of sharing the, those great conversations of two of them on the panel. Um, and I think those sessions are extremely important rather than the panel in terms of direct and more engaging interaction with the experts in the field. And I think maybe for purposes of, of the summer school in the future, maybe that's something that we want to think about, to have a more workshop approach to the decisions of the school. Because you know, you're spending one week here to try and get as much information as you can as an activist, as an academic, uh, something that you may not be able to do to be a master's student, for example, in the program. So um, maybe just a, a, a word of advice to the organizers of the program. Otherwise, it's an excellent program, and I think it was very useful to be here. Uh, apart from that, two quick questions. The one is the, the issue around gender equality, um, Diana, and, and the issue of multi, you know, they are, it's, they, women suffer uh, discrimination at, at uh, several levels. I am wondering whether you've also thought about the, the race aspect, for example, because I know back in the day when we had a part in Namibia and South Africa, there was that issue about um, the discrimination at that level. Because I'm thinking for an African woman, maybe that picture that you are uh, you know, painting may not be an entirely uh, accurate reflection of what are the kinds of discrimination they suffer. And then on the issue of, um, and this is to Elizabeth, Elizabeth, something that we didn't really interrogate, and I think we need to think about it a little bit more carefully, is the issue of um, uh, progressive realization. And while I think it's an important point in terms of us getting to you know, demand those rights, and, and, it's, and we're taking a rights-based approach correctly, so uh, you know, what are the kinds of challenges that we will face at the level of, of implementation? One, two, how do we start a, an easy conversation because demanding and, and toitoying around those issues will not change the minds of our politicians. So what is a more clever and tactical approach that, we, that you would suggest to the House of dealing with the issue of progressive realization without just um, running in and saying, you know, we, we demand it as a right. So if you can maybe just uh, contextualize that specific issue so that we can um, have some strategies that one can work with to, to address the, the, that response that we will probably get from the government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, and I'll start very brief responses from the panel. Julie noted your input and feedback, much appreciated. Um, and we do learn more by doing. So I appreciate it. We'll keep that in mind. So I think I'll go first on, on your question that was directed to me. Uh, you're absolutely right. The, I think gender and disability are not the only two axes that inter intersect in order to create a unique um, experience of discrimination. There's also, like you rightly say, the, the issue of race. So in, in this case, now we're no longer looking at a double axis of discrimination. We're not looking at a triple axis of discrimination. And you're absolutely right. That's something that should have been highlighted as something that which, which, which creates a unique experience of discrimination and I guess, you know, in a sense also complicates the solutions that we would then have to come up with in order to tackle the problem. But you're absolutely right, race does come into it. It's one of the axes that interplay with the other forms of identity, okay? Because you cannot separate the person, right? She is a woman, she is a person with a disability, and she is a, a, an African woman. You, you cannot separate those aspects of her. So those aspects will all interplay together and create an, a unique experience of discrimination. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, thanks for your question, Yvonne. I think that um, on progressive realization, 
in, in Article 19. I think this is one of the places where we see very well how mm -hmm. the CRPD completely blurs the line between rights that we traditionally thought of as civil and political and those that we traditionally thought of as economic um, and social rights. Um, because if you look at A, 19A on its emphasis on choice, that's more civil and political, and C is more services and, you know, which include all manner of things, health, education. So that's the, the first point that I wanted to make. But I think on the, on the point of implementation, how do you bring it down to the ground? It's a um, question that we've been grappling with, and I'll give you a concrete um, example. So on the issue of institutionalization and, and mental health care in Kenya, so one thing is for sure, our national mental health institution is a pretty awful institution, Matare Hospital. Um, on the other hand, we are beginning discussions with government about the right to legal capacity with the Human Rights Commission. So on the one hand, we would like to bring a case on strategic litigation on that hospital because, I mean, conditions are awful. We had a, a CNN, you know, nearly like the BBC one that we saw earlier here. Um, but how do you do this with government? At the same time, you know, sue them, basically. Um, but at the same time, try to negotiate with them on how legal capacity can become a reality. And this is something that we've, we've, we've been, um, together with Open Society Foundation for East Africa as well, have been really thinking about. And I think the, the way we've approached it for now, at least, has been to not go the strategic litigation route yet um, to try and do massive awareness raising. So we've had a lot of that with, with judges led by the Human Rights Commission. Like to, We've approached it by just the first step, a lot of awareness among policymakers um, and, and among implementers, you know, with thinking that, you know, as we go along, then we can become more aggressive. But in the, at the outset, it's been more yeah, awareness raising and training. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and these are really difficult advocacy decisions, you know, that, that sometimes need to be made. But big points. Uh, also, for folks interested in sort of multi, uh, multi dimensional discrimination, um, the orange book out there, <laughs> the one, a European Scandinavian Perspectives on uh, Disability Law and Disability Rights, um, has a nice chapter in it um, by Audney. Uh, from Iceland um, that addresses this topic of multi-dimensional discrimination. I think actually you pointed to a critique of, of equality and non-discrimination in general that, that you know is, is traditionally hinged on you know one form of discrimination, not the lived experience of someone that is in fact much more compl complicated discrimination based on race, <coughs> gender, and disability or whatever. Uh, yes, back here. Thank you, um, Chris from Uganda. Uh, thank you very much to the rapporteurs. I would like to add on the list of um, the violence against women, and I have three scenarios. Um, one is that apart from those that have been highlighted, there is further violence against, for example, a girl child, where, for example, a case in point is where, for example, you have got a disabled mother who may want assistance from, from the daughter, and the daughter is at school preparing for exams, but the mother wants the daughter to guide her. This is a real case scenario where the daughter came and complained, my mother cannot listen to me, I have exams to prepare for, but she wants me to guide her or help her push her wheelchair. So in that case, the rights of this girl child are violated. The other one is a generic one where when mothers give birth to several children, and in this case, in particular, children with albinism, there are cases of where the husbands have either deserted the family, leaving the care to the mother, and uh, for me, this is also another type of violence against women where they, they have looked after these children single-handedly. Then the last one is uh, violation of women's rights by the disability movement itself. 
where there is internal violence, where the men discriminate the women internally, for example, in the DPO. And this can be seen in, for example, lines of employment, but also in practical terms where the consideration of women is not put into limelight. When meetings are being called, no gender considerations are made, and uh, I think this is another set of violations of women's rights. Thank you. Thank you. Can we go two rows back? Um, thank you. My name is Gao I'm from China. Uh, my question is also on the gender equality perspective. I'm concerned about the um, cooperation or non-cooperation between women rights activists and disability rights activists. Um, Note the importance of gender equality perspective um, in promoting disability rights. However, um, in China, the situation is that there is very little cooperation between these two groups. Um, most of, or many of the DPOs in China are led by males who do not necessarily have gender awareness, and except some, except some uh, parents' organization, uh, but their focus is not on gender equality because it's simply because um, they're the mothers who undertake more of the function of caring their children. Um, and also for, for women rights activists, um, they're not very much involved in disability rights movement either because um, according to some feminist theories, sometimes women are somehow related to disability in terms of lacking some of the ability or less capable. So somehow they feel reluctant to get involved because somehow they felt due to the negative image attached to disability. Um, but things are improving recently. We do have an anti-domestic violence law, which is a draft, and it's, it's collecting suggestions from the public. So there are actually some uh, disability rights activists they are sending out saying that, OK, so what kind of challenges are faced by women with disabilities in this kind of cases? But still, the cooperation is, is not that much. So I'm just wondering how is it the case in other places, or do you have any suggestions on that, how we can cooperate better? Thank you. Thank you. And one more right up here. Good afternoon. My name is Agawi Imoka from Nigeria. My question is to Virginia. Um, first, I want to say I wasn't part of the class because I was torn between two, two areas of <laughs> disability issues that I'm very passionate about. So, so I don't know if this question has been treated, but I think I should just ask. You talked about right to vote in institutions. It's an area that in Africa, maybe in Nigeria, we are, we are seriously struggling with. I know that in my office, we are still in court um, with the government just for prisoners' right to vote. And the issue had always been they don't have access to information. So they do not have informed, they, they don't have enough information to make informed decision. So how can they know who to vote for and how to even vote? That was one of the issues that came up. Even imagine where persons with hearing impairment the question is, most times, the argument has always been, our uh, news most times are not translated. Mm -hmm. There's no sign co language conversion of the news. So how, are they having, how do they have information to vote? These are issues that we seriously battle with. And then the quest my question is, what's your advice? What's the best way to go about it? Is it advocacy or is it litigation or rights to vote? Because God knows how many years we've been in court on just prisoners' right to vote. So I'd like to take on that. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to, um, to give each of the panelists a chance to respond. We'll start with Virginia. And Okay. Um, thank you for your question. So we did talk a little bit about this in terms of the challenges. In some countries, people that are institutions aren't allowed to vote at all anyway, much less than have access to the information. Um, so for example, in countries where that's a problem where you're not even allowed to vote when you're in an institution. Some of the things that IFAS does is advocate for the introduction of a mobile ballot box, which means the poll workers, there's poll workers that are specifically responsible for taking a ballot box 
around to all the different, you know, whether it's a hospital or, or institutions, prisons, wherever it might be, so that people can vote in, in secret, put their ballot in the box, and know that it made it in the box. There's multiple variations of this. Um, in some countries, like in the Philippines, for example, they actually bring ballots one by one on a motorcycle to people to vote. The problem with that is that the person then just has to trust, hopefully, fingers crossed, that the person who delivered the ballot will then return it back to their polling station. You know, so in that case, the Philippines was willing, yeah, it's, you know, cross your fingers, hope <laughs> that it makes it there. So the government was willing to make the accommodation, but they wanted the ballot to end up in the same polling station where that person would normally go if they were back in their hometown. And so that, that's how they ended up having this sort of literally one by one sending people out on a motorcycle with a security guard. So can you imagine that the infrastructure that was involved in that, having a poll worker with a security guard, you know, with his gun and everything, the two of them riding motorcycles all around town one by one giving out ballots and then bringing them one by one back to the right polling station. Um, so it's, you know, it's a positive step that the government took, but maybe not, not the best. The other issue is in terms of jurisdictions. What if you're in an institution that is outside of where you would normally vote, in another state, another county, whatever? Are you allowed to still vote, even in places where there's a mobile ballot box provision? Sometimes the answer is no. They have a mobile ballot box, but it's only if your institution is in the same jurisdiction as where you're registered to live. So there's a lot of issues with that. And then you have, you know, the good question you brought up, so you are actually allowed to vote in the institution. How do you receive information on how to mark your ballot, who to vote for, those sorts of things. Um, so a lot of the work that we do is, is advocacy with the election management bodies in terms of the dissemination methods for their information. Um, you might as well not produce all these voter registration or voter education materials if they're not disseminated in ways that are gonna definitely reach the right people. Um, so one of the examples that we also discussed in the session was about some um, campaigns that we've done around targeting women with disabilities and knowing that you're more likely to find women with disabilities in marketplaces, for example. And so developing voter education materials that are specifically targeted to your audience and knowing where your audience is. Um, we also talked about some examples, um, again, from the Dominican Republic of the government there going to rehabilitation centers because they knew that's where they could find people with disabilities. So it's, it's also, though, working with the political parties, which in many ways is more complicated. Um, political parties aren't seeing people with disabilities as a voting block, and so they're not even developing materials in accessible formats, much less addressing areas that are important to people with disabilities in their political party manifestos. Um, so in our experience, we found working with the EMB is actually the, the fastest route. In some places, that's not, that's not fast route at all either. Um, and in countries where the EMB has responsibility for mandating which parties are allowed to officially run for office, that's a, a really good benefit for you because then you're able to advocate with the election management body that political parties have to produce information in accessible formats and that they have to disseminate it in accessible venues, um, making that one of the criteria for being registered as an official political party. Um, in many countries, that's not actually the case, but in, if your country is like that, then that's a good way for you to advocate is go through the election management body and make that something that they require of political parties. Thank you. Um, I'll take I'll take just a question um, on on violence against women. The one where the woman with a disability needs assistance from her daughter, which then impacts on the daughter's the child's right to education. I think the first thing to say is how that highlights lack of services, lack of um, support services for living independently in the community. That's that 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 example really really highlights that and um, I mean that it's a difficult question what I'd say is there are um, so there are beginnings of social protection um, sort of solutions um, the government of Kenya has begun to pilot cash transfer pro project programs to people with disabilities which then put some money in the pocket, like we had from the other presentation, which will then allow the person to hire or to have, you know, to, to pay for assistance from, from someone else if the person doesn't have a job themselves. So that's one thing. Um, you know, because it's a pilot project, of course, it doesn't cover that many places. So it's, it's just that issue of chronic lack of, of services. and we are a long way away from where we have personalized support services. And 
I was discussing this with someone in the course of, 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 of the presentation and we saw how sort of even in terms of priorities, if I was to, if a lot of times when you're speaking with government and they ask you, so what one thing on disability should, should we act on? And, <laughs> and it's really, really difficult, but I can assure you personalized support services in our context, it, it, it will not be the high priority because they will say, well, family can do that, yet we see family doesn't always do that. But at a certain point on this one, I, I have to say, in, in my context, compulsory school primary education is, um, if, if a parent doesn't do that, it's actually a criminal offense. So I think this, these are hard choices, but at a certain point, a line needs to be drawn in the sand, like we said earlier, and say, you know, certain things, you know, a child needs to access education and, uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll take your two scenarios, later two scenarios, since Elizabeth is taking the first one. Um, the one, the, the first one being the one about the mom who gives birth to a child with albinism and then is sort of um, almost punished for that. Um, I think what that demonstrates is the kind of societal prejudices. Um, which are a huge, huge problem and mostly are a huge drive behind discrimination, especially the one that is faced by uh, women with, um, with disabilities. Um, so I think it's a complex issue at the same time because it involves uh, sometimes cultural beliefs, cultural values or religious beliefs and oftentimes these are quite deeply rooted. Um, as far as people know, like for example, in one part of, the, the, of Africa, I think it's in Tanzania, mm -hmm. um, where it, it's, it's part of the religious belief that if you have body parts of someone with albinism, then that will make you rich. Yes, well, she, yeah, th thanks for that. She says it's, it's, it's rich, witchcraft. So these, this is just, I think, an example of some of the very harmful uh, societal beliefs. And I think there is really no way around it except just to try and educate people, just to try and sensitize people about the rights of persons with disabilities. I wish there was like a shortcut way. If anybody has a shortcut way of doing it, I'd, I'd love to hear it. But I think it's very important to just push that awareness raising uh, point forward. Um, and then the, 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 the last point that you raised was about um, internal violence where the men discriminate against the women. And I think this is, this, this is something, it's a challenge that is faced by, by women in general, but especially by women with, women with disabilities. And that I think the point of our, our discussion yesterday was we were trying to come up with solutions. All right, what we, we have, these discriminations, what do we do about them? How do we advise governments when they're coming up with policies on how to, um, to address these issues of, discri of discrimination? And I think um, this might sound like a legal answer, but we have to think about things in an equality framework. I, I like to sort of think about things from an equality framework, is that we need to, our starting point needs to be the recognition that everybody is inherently equal, right? Regardless of difference, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of any other uh, attribute, human attribute, we all start from a point, a basic point of equality. And I think taking it from there, if we start to um, generate policies that that have an, or work from an equality framework, I think we'll actually get get somewhere. Though it's, it can take, it can be a long road and, and be a lot of hard work. And then um, finally, I think there was a question up there as well about women's rights. That, well, that women's rights don't have knowledge on disability, and then disability activists don't have knowledge about gender. And I think this, this, this is it. This is the point we were trying to highlight yesterday, was the invisibility of women with disabilities in particular from all, that had, all the discourse that has been taking place around violence against women. I think the discourse around violence against women is old. I mean, it started 
long ago, which is a great thing. But it has, in a lot of senses, left out women with disabilities uh, for one reason or another. And I think this is one aspect of the, the CRPD which I think is, is quite positive, is the very fact that it recognizes that women with disabilities do face a unique experience of discrimination. And because of that, when governments uh, formulate their policies, that intersectional discrimination needs to be at the forefront of, of their minds in formulating any policies that deal with those sorts of things. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to bring the CRPD speed dating to a close. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone. Uh, this evening, there is a special event, an international dress-up party, to be defined as you would like to define it, I guess, at 9 p.m. in Busker Browns in the heart of Galway City. Um, and the address will be sent to everyone via email, but you can, as you leave, um, get further information um, from Virginia or Katie or apparently lived on Facebook or stuff like that. So join the party tonight, again, 9 o'clock, Buster Browns, in international dress-up fashion. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, <laughs>